Okay, so now we're going to take a look at a case study on the Living Building Challenge. And these slides are courtesy of Revision Architecture, Andrew Pogon, AKF, Consilience, Marion, M2, etc. So we thank, we thank all of you for the rights to use this or the ability to use this in this course. And, um, and it's going to be broken into two parts. So first we're going to use the slides that these guys created to talk about the Living Building Challenge. And then we're going to use the slides to talk about a project that I got to work on uh, a while back that's now under construction and is under submission for Living Building Challenge. And uh, so let's talk about the Living Building Challenge in more detail than we did in our intro lecture. You saw this slide before. And again, here the idea of getting into a regenerative future, the idea that a building site interior could actually make the planets, could actually increase the planet's resources and regenerate our ecosystems. It's pretty amazing. Uh, I want to just give you a heads up that this is, uh, these slides are a little old, so they're based probably on Living Building Challenge rating system number two. Rating system number three is, has been updated and has a lot of new features, which I will um, deal with in the text in the course. So, six petals, 16 requirements. All must be met to receive designation, to get the full designation. So we've got site, energy, water, materials, indoor quality, and beauty and inspiration. These are the petals of the flower. Now, um, so let's talk about site, responsible site selection, limits to growth, habitat exchange. What we're worried about here, obviously, is protecting and enhancing our ecosystem. So when we think about responsible site selection, this looks a lot like lead. You don't want to build on prime farmland in floodplains, et cetera. Um, you certainly don't want to have, and you certainly want to have limits to growth. So you, you want to build on previously developed sites. Um, as often as you can. And the one that I find most interesting here is this idea of habitat exchange. So you have to set aside land that um, is undisturbed to take up for or react to the land that you disturbed. Um, so projects must set aside land equal to that of the development. And if they don't have it, they have to get it from some other place by purchasing the rights to that. Um, certainly energy is a big part of living building challenge and um, what we want to do here is to go for net zero energy and as I said before in version 3 we're looking at 105 percent energy generation so we want to export energy back out into the grid which is really the trend that we're looking towards. Imagine the end of power plants where every building is not only generating its own power but enough power to, to supply the grid. It's a pretty example. Pretty, pretty exciting I'd say. Now, one of the strongest and most controversial aspects of the Living Building Challenge system, of course, is the red list, which we'll talk about. But it also looks at carbon footprint, responsible industry, and leadership. So the red list. Uh, using the precautionary principle, which, by the way, I have not covered in this course, and established toxicity data, certain chemicals and materials should be excluded from building products. Um, and I think that's a typo there, but that's okay. You just keep going. Um, the thing to remember here is the precautionary principle says even if we're not sure whether a chemical is going to have damage to our planet, we might want to, as a precaution, not use it and think about what, this, what the damage could be in the future. Here are the different chemicals. I would point out PVC, polyvinyl chloride as one. I would point out lead, mercury, formaldehyde. These are, yes, yeah, added because there, there's formaldehydes in a lot of things. These are chemicals and compounds that are considered toxic and what the people at the Living Futures Institute want to do is get these out of the waste, out of the product stream. Uh, construction carbon footprint is one of my favorites. I've begin, I'm beginning to get calls which are requiring construction managers to calculate their carbon footprint of their process. Not that hard to do. There are calculators out there. And then to purchase a one-time carbon offset to uh, essentially mitigate the impacts of that. Responsible Industry looks at FSC certified lumber, which is the Forest Stewardship Council. Every country has their own. This tends to be one of the big ones in the US. Um, there are other standards for other industries that they will begin to use as they become available. Uh, certainly, you want to get all of your products within a very short radius. And uh, the shorter the radius, the less embodied energy that you're using. And Living Building Challenge uh, version 3, I believe, is at a 100-mile radius. And uh, if that's wrong, I'll correct that in the text of the course. And of course, leadership and construction waste, we want to divert about 95% or 90% of all materials that come off of a construction site. I know this is possible. I've personally worked on projects where they've gotten 99%. And so what we're doing is transforming the construction industry from something that might have been considered wasteful in the past 
to something that's very lean and efficient in the future. Now, water is really critical here. Um, obviously, depending on where you live, water plays a very different role. And uh, what we're trying to do here is get to net zero water. Now, obviously, if you live in California, uh, especially Southern California, getting net zero water is impossible. Living Building Challenge has morphed and evolved over the years to understand what it means to build in different ecosystems. So there's possibilities um, to still achieve Living Building Challenge in these different areas. Obviously, if, if you live in the Pacific Northwest, where Living Building Challenge was conceived, pretty easy to do. But basically, um, it's rainwater, right? You're looking at um, getting all of your building functioning, including drinking water eventually, from rainwater. If you live in a town where codes will forbid you to drink the water that's been cleaned on site, then that is the case. Uh, sustainable water discharge. This is a standard practice now in sustainable design. 100% of all storm water must be dealt with on site. No letting water go off site or into sewers anymore. Indoor quality, civilized environment, healthy air, healthy air. This is uh, looking at the quality of life that we might have inside our environments. Um, so we have operable windows. Now I know that seems crazy to you, but if you think of how many skyscrapers exist in the world with curtain walls that don't open or, or don't allow fresh air directly into space. And there's lots of reasons for that, but um, what Living Building Challenge is pushing that. And then of course, natural light, getting natural light into every space is required. Seems obvious, but yet we build lots of buildings that don't do this. Um, the criteria here is we're gonna do some um, tracking systems for our shoes to separate dirt before it comes in. We're gonna have separate ventilation systems. Obviously, if you think about Green Guard, for example, which we talked about in another video, we're gonna have non-toxic materials, um, no smoking. And then finally, air change rates are gonna be more often and more frequent than typical, which will actually use a little bit more energy than a standard building. So there's even more pressure on the solar to offset that. Um, and then finally, we get to the subjective, the really subjective ones, beauty and spirit, inspiration and education. And uh, the project must contain elements intended solely for human delight and the celebration of culture, spirit and place appropriate to the building. In other words, bringing art and design into a much more prominent level of uh, thinking about sustainability and what makes a sustainable project. If you watched my introductory video, you would know that if it's not beautiful, it's not sustainable. That comes from Lance Hosey. Um, I use the term quadruple bottom line to reflect the need for beauty and sustainability. And certainly the buildings should educate as part of what we decided to do in earlier lectures was change human behavior and, that and change the way people think so that we can begin to move towards a more sustainable future. Okay, so let me stop there and then we'll do the